Good morning, friends, and uh, just so glad to be here. I can't believe that it is December 18th. We are one week away from Christmas. This is week four of Advent, uh, the week of love. I just can't believe that we are here already. It seems like this year we have blinked and it has flown by. I'm not sure how you feel, but that's how I'm feeling at this moment. Uh, today we're looking at Isaiah 44, 21 to 45, 7. Uh, and it says, Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. I have made you. You are my servant. Israel, I will not forget you. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath. Burst into song, you mountains you forest and all your trees, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob. He displays his glory in Israel. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by it myself, who foils the signs of false prophets, and who makes fools of uh, diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers? Who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited? Of the towns of Judah, they shall be rebuilt. And of the ruin, their ruins, I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams? Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please? He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. This is what the Lord says to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him to, so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summoned you by name, for the sake of my, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen. I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor. Though you do not acknowledge me, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, People may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Let's pray. God, we uh, thank you for these words, God, and I pray that you would speak truth into our hearts today, God. Allow us to, to hear what we need to hear today, God. You know what we need in this moment, God. And I just pray that we would hear it, Lord, that we would hear your voice whispering in us, God, that we would feel your spirit moving in us, God. Lord, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wanted to share this story. Um, I don't remember the first time I heard it, uh, but it's a great story about my father-in-law, John, and my brother-in-law, Brian. Um, years and years ago, I don't remember how old Brian was, but they were driving home either from Ohio or Pittsburgh uh, from spending time with family. And it was just the two of them. Um, my father-in-law had a conversion van. You guys remember those? They were really popular in like the 80s and 90s, I think, maybe before that. But uh, he loved it. Um, the two of them were driving in it. Um, and so he stops at a rest stop, you know, because it's a long drive. And you're the only one. he's the only one that can drive. So... Uh, he tries to get Brian up, um, but he doesn't get up. Um, if you don't know, my wife's family has a gift of sleeping. I'm very jealous because uh, they can sleep anywhere, anytime, and can sleep and sleep and sleep. And so he stays asleep in the car. John goes in, comes out, and just heads on the road again. Um, he arrives at home and tries to get Brian up, uh, again, to help unload everything. You know, I think they had golf clubs because they probably were golfing. Um but doesn't see Brian get up. He doesn't help. Uh, finally goes inside, and his wife, Shirley, asks him if he knows where Brian is. And he said, asleep in the car. Um, he's just not helping bring anything in. He just won't get up. Uh, but she breaks the news to him that he's not in the car, that he's not in the conversion van. He's at the rest stop. He must have woken up when he was at the rest stop and wandered in. 
John left him without realizing. John didn't look behind him. He didn't think about it. He thought Brian was still sleeping in the back. So Brian was basically alone at this rest stop. It's, it's well before the time of cell phones where he, John could have gotten a text and he could have headed back. He had to spend hours on that road going back and forth to that rest stop once again. But I'm wondering if Brian must have felt and forgotten in that moment. I mean, who knows what was going through his head at such a young age being there by himself. Can anyone relate to Brian? Were you ever forgotten in this life? You know, left somewhere? You can share your stories with me or, or each other later. Um, or you can type them in the comments. Um, but maybe they weren't for physically forgotten. Maybe just left out. Have you ever felt forgotten? Forgotten by family? by friends, by loved ones, by co-workers or bosses. Maybe you just felt invisible. How about forgotten by God? Do you ever feel like God has forgotten about us here on earth? Like, where are you, God? How many times have you said that? Where are you, God? I know that I've said it. Just feeling like God has, has forgotten us, forgotten me. I mean, we look around at the world today and we wonder if God's left us at a rest stop. I mean, the world's crazy right now, right? The division, the hatred, the violence, the greed, poverty, hunger, people hungry for power, the sickness and disease, the climate change, and the list can go on and on and on. And it doesn't seem like it's going to get any better anytime soon. This past week, uh, Mateo was sick, as most kids are, are getting sick this time of year, and I had to take him to urgent care Monday um, afternoon, early afternoon, like right afternoon, and um, you know, we weren't sure what he had. I did a COVID test, came back negative, just wanted to make sure it wasn't the flu, and really wanted to get that, that honored doctor's uh, note so he can get an excused absence from school. Um, so I go to the urgent care, and it is slow on Monday. Uh, it's not super busy, but must probably short staff like so many other places. So we were there all together for two and a half hours. And so therefore, there was no way I was getting out in time to pick up the other two from school. And so I had uh, Jay taken care of, uh, and I thought I had Liam taken care of. I asked my friend to text her son to pass a message to Liam because... He won't get a cell phone till next year, I think, sometime. But anyway, Liam never got the message. And I finally got a, a phone call from the school. Uh, Liam was frantic. Um, he was upset. He thought that I forgot him or something bad happened to me. Um, but he just didn't get that message. And it made me think about, maybe that's us. Maybe we don't... Get that message from God, that God hasn't forgotten us. You know, even though it may feel like it, even though the world looks like it's going to crap, God has not forgotten us. The, this section of scripture that I read from Isaiah 44, verse 21, it starts with this. Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. I have made you. You are my servant, Israel. I, have not, I will not forget you. I will not forget you. Let those words sink in for a moment. God created us. God could never forget us. God formed us. God knows us. God does not forget you. God has not forgotten us. God is with us always and forever. The people in Isaiah's time needed to be reminded of this, and those who would hear it later while in Babylonian exile and captivity needed to hear this. Waiting for God. And I think we need to be hearing it as well. They were waiting. You know, we celebrate right now the season of Advent. There's these four weeks leading up to Christmas. Uh, it's, a, it's a season of waiting and eager, eager expectation. We're waiting for God to act. We're waiting like the people in Israel's time, Isaiah's time. We're waiting for the time where Jesus will come and make all things new. Amen? We are waiting for a time where Jesus will come and set all things right. But it is a time of waiting. And patience is needed. 
The world will not always be like it is right now. Things will get better. Even amidst of everything going around us, we can be sure of this, that God is with us. That God will never, ever, ever forget us. Maybe you need that reminder today that God has not forgotten you. That God sees you. God loves you. God cares for you. Verse 21 starts with this word, remember. Remember, think back, reflect. Remind yourselves that, that God is faithful. God is good. That God loves you. Remember that God makes good on God's promises. And it kind of was peppered, salt and peppered throughout that passage about that. At one point, the, the text says it calls Cyrus God's shepherd, meaning that Cyrus is going to do something good and helpful for Israel. Then, it, then the text says that Cyrus is the Lord's anointed, that, that God called Cyrus the Lord's anointed, that Cyrus will rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, that Cyrus is called to do the Lord's work. And as we have seen throughout the years, before our time, during our time, and we will see past our time, is that God raises up people over the years to do this work. Cyrus was the Messiah for that time. Jesus is the Messiah for all time. Amen? But Cyrus was there to deliver them from their earthly exile. And it's really neat to, to realize that this prediction was 150 to 200 years before it happened. Cyrus was named in the original text. They couldn't go back and, and, and change it. It goes back to early manuscripts. His name was there. Prediction and fulfillment. God promised to bring back the exiles from around the world. God promised to be there. Predictive prophecy. Promises. What God says will happen, will happen. God backs God's word. A promise from God is a statement we can depend on with absolute confidence. A statement we can depend on with absolute confidence. Standing on the promises of God. An old hymn, but it's so good. No matter what's happening around us, no matter what's happening to us, we can always stand on the promises of God. See, the thing is, is that too many times... We're not good at keeping promises. I'm sure each one of us has broken a promise to somebody. And you know what? Somebody's broken a promise to us. But we can't project how others have failed us onto God. We cannot project how others have failed us onto God. God is faithful. God will make good on God's promises. And we can't break God's promises by leaning on them. Amen? You can't break God's promises by leaning on them. That's where we should lean. There are approximately 8,810 promises in the entire Bible. In the Old Testament, there are 7,706. And in the New Testament, there are 1,104. Wonderful promises. Deuteronomy 28 has 133 promises, which is more than any other chapter in the Bible. We're sitting on the premises when we ought to be standing on the promises, of our, observes Vance Havner. Dr. George Sweeting once estimated that more than a fourth of the Bible is predictive prophecy. Both the Old and New Testaments are full of promises about the return of Jesus Christ. Over 1,800 references appear in the Old Testament, and 17 Old Testament books give prominence to this theme. Of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are more than 300 references to the Lord's return, one out of every 30 verses. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to this great event. For every prophecy of, on the first coming of Christ, there are eight on Christ's second coming. Promises. God promise. God will make good on. And I just want to share these from, uh, just from January 1st, 1985, from Our Daily Bread. There's 12 promises for the Christian claim. And there's many more, but I just want to share these verses with you. God's presence. From Hebrews 13, 15, it says, I will never leave you. God's protection. I am your shield. Genesis 15, 1. God's power. I will strengthen you. 
Isaiah 41.10. God's provision, I will help you. Isaiah 41.10. God's leading, and this is the words of Jesus from John 10.4. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. God's purposes. Jeremiah 29.11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God's rest. Come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11.28 God's cleansing. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's goodness. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. God's faithfulness. The Lord will not forsake God's people for God's great name's sake. 1 Samuel 12, 22. God's guidance. The meek will God guide. Psalm 25, 9. God's wise plan. All things work together for good to them that love God. Romans 8, 28. So when have you seen God fulfill a promise? I'm sure that all of us have seen it sometime in our lives. But we are also in a time between the promise and the fulfillment. You know, we are really in that time. There is a time between a promise and a fulfillment. And that's where we are in our lives right now, to some, in some respects. This is a part where we honor, that we honor during Advent. That yes, Jesus will come. God has promised that. And set all things right. But not yet. Promises of God give us hope. And I think many of us need that hope right now. So Jesus came to make a way for us. You know, God provides a way through, through Cyrus. You know, it's a temporary way. And God provides the way for Cyrus. If you go back to Isaiah 45... One, verses 1 and 2, it talks about how God will make sure that, uh, that Cyrus has what Cyrus needs. That God will provide the way for the work. God will go before us to make a way. God provided a way when it seemed like there was no way for them. For us. All throughout time. And we celebrate this every Christmas. We celebrate the way every Christmas, right? Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. Jesus came to provide the way, but also to be the way. I love these words from George Herbert uh, in his hymn, which is the first line of the song too. Come, my way, my truth, my life. Such a way as gives breath, gives us breath. Such a truth as ends all strife. Such a life as killeth death. And isn't that Jesus, right? Jesus gives us breath. Jesus will one day end all strife. And Jesus defeated all evil and death on the cross. Jesus, who is God, came to prepare a way for us. Yes, it means a way to God, a way for all people to live in relationship with God, both now and forever, a flourishing life here on earth and for eternity. Remember that the way that Jesus provided is more than just about eternal security. You know, Jesus being the way isn't about just getting into heaven. That's not the only way that Jesus provided for us. Is it an important way? Yes. But it's not the only way. We need to stop thinking that way. I think it's too toxic. You know, it's so much more, isn't it? Salvation is so much more than just being saved from when we die. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Jesus is a way maker. Even when things look bad, Jesus will make a way when there is no way. And it reminded me back to Isaiah 43, 19, and says, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Jesus can help us through the obstacles of life. You know, Jesus never said life's going to be easy. He said quite the opposite. He said, I'll be with you. You know, like, you can have peace because, look, I've overcome it all. 
you know, Jesus is the way to overcome, to persevere through our, our difficulties, our problems, our troubles, to have peace in the midst of them. Jesus is the way, and Jesus is the guide. Jesus walks with us. We are not alone. But Jesus also shows us how to walk. Jesus is the way to walk. The earliest disciples of Jesus were called the followers of the way. If you go back to what Paul said, Paul said, I'm going to condemn the followers of the way. That was the disciples of Jesus. Anyone who followed Jesus were called followers of the way. <clears throat> followers of rabbis literally walked in their footsteps. They followed behind the rabbi. When Jesus called the disciples, he said, come, follow me. Antonio Machado says the way is made by walking. The way is made by walking. The earliest disciples were not committed to a religion, but basically a way of life, a way of living like Jesus. Did you hear that? They weren't committed to a religion, but basically a way of life, a way of living like Jesus. Following Jesus is the way to live our lives. Henry Nouwen said, following Jesus is moving away from fear and toward love. And that relates to something we talked about weeks ago about stop living in fear. When we follow Jesus, we move away from fear and toward love. Following Jesus is a way of love. It's a way of love, it's a way to love, and it's a way to be loved, to experience the deep, Unconditional love of God. Jesus is the way to abundant life. And we must follow that way. <clears throat> Who's ready to follow it? Let's pray. Lord God, we, we thank you, uh, God, that you do not forget us. God, that you are always with us. Lord, that no matter what's going on around us, no matter what's happening in the world, God, that you are here with us, that you have not forgotten us. God, that we might be in between that time of promise and fulfillment. But God, we know that you are faithful. God, that you are good. God, and that you would make good on your promises. That one day all things will be made right. That all things will be made new. One day Jesus will come again and make set all things right. God, we look forward to that day. God, we thank you that Jesus is the way the way to you, that Jesus makes a way for us. But God, I, I pray that we would also walk in that way. God, that we would walk like Jesus, that we would walk in the way of love, loving you and loving others as we love ourselves. God, help us to be known as followers of the way. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all. Have a good week. Much love. Peace.